Welcome to the uh, second in my series of lectures on rigging. This is going to be on chapter one from our text. At this point, I think most of you have the text. If you're still missing it, that's okay. The information in this little uh, presentation should be enough to answer the questions that were assigned. Uh, a lot of you have already completed them. But we start out with a discussion of the, the common tools that are used in rigging hoists and uh, slings and uh, other special devices. And these are examples of hoists. You would connect this to, uh, to a load and then lift it up. This is another type that runs on a rail so that it can be uh, positioned. And these often also go uh, in the perpendicular direction, so they have kind of an XY axis, so they have a lot of a wide uh, range of uh, a big area that they can be used in. And then here's uh, here's one of these uh, cranes that we're used to seeing in construction areas. This is the uh, the scene after that uh, crane collapse that I asked you guys to do some research on, and that was all caused by failure of a nylon sling and uh, I think the in in the investigation and we'll have to follow up on this to make sure but in the investigation they uh, several of you have sent me a uh, analysis saying that they decided that they should have by rights the uh, the riggers should have been using eight chain uh, slings and instead they use synthetic slings now synthetic slings are very strong and they can be used in a lot of ways but one of the slings was uh, not, you know, an inspection would have shown that it was obviously uh, not fully uh, in good shape. It was, it, was, uh, it was damaged, it was worn in such a way that it, uh, it was really what caused the failure. And the cost of replacing the, the sling uh, would have been almost nothing. Whereas the cost of this accident in the heart of Manhattan with all the people killed is probably going to get into the billions of dollars before they're all done with it. Uh, so that's an example of how a small decision that was made on the site in the heat of the moment can have a lasting impact. So hoists are, you know, the things that lift, such as cranes. They can be manual. In other words, uh, something that you... Uh, pull up using your using your hands without you know some kind of mechanical advantage and they can be powered electric or or otherwise underhung or top running those are self-explanatory terms an underhung hoist would be one that is underneath uh, whatever it uh, travels on see I think the one we looked at before this would be uh, underhung here And top running would be one where the uh, the mechanism actually rides on top of the of the beam. Uh, monorails, jib cranes. Uh, the jib crane is usually well, that would be one of these guys. What we often think of when we think of a crane. Uh, this would be a uh, an underhung device. So slings, I think most of you in the uh, questions explain this. It's just a way to suspend a load. It can be wire rope, welded link chain. Fiber uh, and synthetic webbing are used quite a bit. They're very strong and they, they're light and they can take, uh, they can, uh, and they won't damage the, uh, they won't damage the load like things like chain will. They're usually made ahead of time, and they have to uh, they have to meet certain uh, requirements in manufacturing and, and strength. And then there's special devices. When you have uh, large things that uh, big pieces of sheet metal, huge co coils of steel, big rolls of paper, uh, large sheets of glass. 
buckets of molten metal, those all require kind of specialized uh, devices. And usually the, uh, the lifting device in some way, shape, or form is going to be made to hang from a hook. And some examples of those are mechanical grabs, vacuum lifters, those great big electromagnets that you all always see in the movies that they use to pick up and drop junk cars, uh, specialized clamps, things like that. <clears throat> the rigging uh, system is made up of uh, different components. The hoist, we talked about what that does, the sling, and then the load itself. And those uh, have to work together to, uh, to get the job done. And putting them together is, is the job of the rigger make sure it's properly designed. So the questions that have to be answered before you do anything is, well, well what am I going to do with this? Where am I going to put it? What tools do you need? Can the tools handle the, uh, the forces that are going to be put on them? How are you going to hook it up? And as soon as you pick that load up, what's going to happen? I mean, if it's off to the side and you pick it up, it's immediately going to swing. That's something to be considered. More questions. Uh, what is the path from picking it up to putting it down? What's in the way? Is there anything underneath it? How will the load be uh, put down? Other considerations, the weather. Are there wires overhead? Uh, is there a slope involved? Are we uh, having trouble seeing? Is there a visibility issue? And then uh, are enough people involved? Or, in some cases, are there too many people involved so that uh, there gets to be confusion about who's in charge and who's giving direction? So some of the basic skills, you have to be able to determine the weight of the load, and that's often given. You have to be able to find the center of gravity. You have to be able to identify the, the parts of a diagonal force. And you need to know the weakest link in the rigging system. Finding the weight. The, the easiest, best way is to use the manufacturer's data if you're given it. Uh, and in, in section 116, it gives information about how to find the weight of a particular beam. See a 10 foot S15 by 42.9 beam. In, in the case of this one, the 42.9 is uh, pounds per foot and it's 10 feet so in this case all you have to do is multiply the number of feet times, times the pound per feet uh, and the information for these uh, other ones is given in a table which is on page 8 of your book and we'll, we'll talk about that in class Uh, here's some uh, little geometry for you. These are different formulas for finding area and volume of different figures. For the most part, you're going you're gonna to know the weight of something before you start. So I don't want to spend a lot of time going through this. It, it's pretty basic math, and we can discuss it more in class if you like. So finding the area and volume really depends on uh, the weight per unit. And... Uh, the, uh, there was one of the homework or one of the quiz questions I gave you uh, about if you're given a value in pounds per cubic feet, inches, uh, and you find the volume, you have to give the volume in the same units that you're given. That's, that's the, only, uh, the only point that's trying to be made there. The breaking strength of the rope, that's the whatever the, the rated strength is. Uh, and this was also a question off the quiz. To find the load limit, you divide the, uh, the breaking strength by the design factor. And the design factor that's, that's typically used in... The, the design factor is five, in other words... It needs to be five times. You, you need to make sure that whatever you're using is one-fifth. The maximum size load would be one-fifth the, uh, the braking strength. So in this example, if you have a design factor of four 
and uh, the, the rope has a breaking strength of 5,000 pounds, you would just divide 5,000 by 4, and then that's the maximum load that you would ever want to place on that rope. So it would be one-fourth of 5,000. Center of gravity, or mass, that's where the load balances. And the lifting point, and some of you kind of missed, missed this one a little bit on the quiz. It wasn't really a, a big deal, but when you lift something, you want to make sure that you're lifting it directly above the center of gravity. It just shows what happens if you don't. In this case, this is the center of gravity for the object, so you want to lift it at that point. If you lift it further over, it's going to cause a movement when it gets picked up off the ground. <clears throat> then you should always make sure that you attach to the load above the center of gravity. So in, in this case, if you attached it down lower here, um, if the center of gravity is right here and you attach it down here and you pick it up, uh, it could flip and do surprising things for you. If you're on a skid or a pallet, the rules are a little bit different. You can't apply it below the center of gravity in that case. But you want to make sure that where the ropes come together is above the center of gravity. Now this is kind of a dramatic picture looking down from a crane on a turbine that's under construction. You can see they're still getting the, uh, the blade put together down here, or the hub. Uh, this looks like a I was going to say it looks like a GE turbine. I'm not so sure now. And this is an image of a of a nacelle on the ground. You can see some of the, you know, this is a little bit off topic for rigging, I guess, but you can see some of the components. Here's the yaw gear. These motors are going to, you know, control the the rotation of the the direction of the turbine as it points into the wind. As you can see up here, they have, on large things like this, they usually have built-in lift points that are clearly marked so that uh, when they do lift it, they know exactly where to do it. This is an example of what happens uh, if you lift it with a single rope or a single cable, you have 2,000 pounds of force being exerted on that. If you lift it with two cables directly up, now you've divided that force in half. Each cable now has a thousand pounds, assuming that you're pulling it straight up. If we were to go further and have three or four, you would further divide the force that each cable is subjected to. Now when you put them at angles, now we start to have to think a little right triangle trig here. Because now what's happening is you have a certain amount of force pulling up, you have a certain amount of force pulling this way, and together they add up to more than either one of those. So you can see what happens as the angle goes up, right? Uh, let me correct that. As the angle gets smaller, in other words, as this becomes closer and closer to down here, you get uh, larger numbers. So what does that mean? That means you want to have a, a, a large angle here. So the closer to 90 degrees you are, the, the less uh, force it's going to be subjected to. <clears throat> In some cases, you, you want to use a spreader beam, as if we were to lift this, uh, this truss. In the, in the way that's shown here, it could uh, certainly damage it. Whereas here, the, those forces, you know, the vertical and the horizontal are, well, the horizontal part is eliminated. You don't have this force pulling this way anymore. You only have it pulling up, which is what you want. And then you have uh, sling arrangements here. This is, this is called a basket choker, which is nice because it puts a gripping force on the load, chokes it. Uh, the bridle, 
you've got the force divided among these four uh, parts of the sling. Then the double choker, where you, you basically got two, two chokers together, and the double basket. And each of those has its place. Uh, well, as far as the lab goes, we'll, we'll talk about that in class. Uh, I do have some simulation software that we may want to try out. I don't want to spend the, a whole lot of time learning how to use it. It's something that, that we used in the physics classes, and uh, it's kind of neat. And if nothing else, it, it sort of helps you to uh, see how some of these things work in an environment that's pretty safe and you don't have to worry about, about breaking things and so forth. So that's kind of a rundown in Chapter 1. Uh, read through the book, skim through it when you can. If you haven't answered the questions yet, hopefully this will give you enough to at least get a good start on those. And if you have more questions about it, you can email me or we'll talk about it in class.